Welcome, E4 Family Church. We're in our real life priority series, and we're talking about faith. This week's message is about faith and continuing to run the race that God has set before you. Don't grow weary in your well-doing. If God be for you, then who can be against you? Finish your race well. E4 Kids, your worship service starts right now at e4familychurch.com. And your lesson is all about our good creator, God the Father, who has created us in his likeness and in his image. And he has put within us creativity. Parents, if you need any assistance, please look at our parent guide that will help you with today's lesson. I invite you to worship the Lord through your giving at e4familychurch.com. Thank you to all of those who have given and continue to give. Our summer groups are still going. Join a Bible study that will work for you, either online or in person. It's time to pray. Join me in lifting up our cares before the Lord. God, we are so thankful for who you are. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. God, we thank you for your grace that you give us, God, to start afresh. God, I pray you would help each one of us today that we won't grow weary in our well-doing, that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged through the message today to finish the race that you you have set before us today in Jesus name. Amen. Let's worship. There was a moment when the lights went out, when death had claimed its victory. King of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned With final breath and it was finished not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn But sacrifice was made As the heavens Oh, 
trust that he is Lord. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing. about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, a massive crowd gathered outside the synagogue to hear him speak. Like any crowd, they were coming from many different places and many different perspectives. Young and old, men and women, rich and poor. But every person in that crowd had this one thing in common. They were tired, tired of life, tired of religion, tired of waiting. And so he looked out upon this multitude of people who were scared, confused, and tired. And he told them, come to me. And that offer still stands for every one of us. Come to Jesus, all who were tired, all who are hurting, all who feel unworthy, all who feel unloved, all who have nothing left to give, come to Jesus. Bring your burdens, bring your fears, bring your biggest regrets and your worst mistakes, bring your broken dreams and your painful disappointments, bring your chains and bring your addictions, bring it all and come to Jesus, because he will receive you and he will redeem you. He will love you and He will lead you. He will accept you and forgive you. He will guide you and comfort you. He will care for you and watch over you. He will transform you and sustain you. So all who are weary, all who are lost, all who are tired, come as you are. Come today. Come to Jesus. Hello, family. I wanted to take a minute today to encourage you to keep going, having faith to keep running. And it can be so hard, especially when, man, days are long and it looks like people around you who are not doing the right thing are being rewarded. But friends, that's temporary. You will never know the impact that you have if you quit. I'll never forget senior year, hanging around a bunch of guys, Air Force training, and you know how it is. Curse word here, curse word there. That just wasn't my style. But this one day, man, I don't know what was going on, but they made me so mad. And you know, there's levels to these curse words, right? I mean, you got this one, that one, and then, you know, woo, right? And I don't know what it was, what happened in that day. But I said something. Something small. It wasn't one of these. It was you know, one of those. And I said it. Man, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I regretted it. But it was too late. It came out. I was like, <gasps> as soon as it came out of my mouth, a friend of mine on the other side of the table who, man, that was like his, 
his first language. You know how some people got, you know, Spanish or French or German? No, he his was cursing. That was like just the way he spoke. He comes around the table and he says, not you, Gabe, not you. And I was shocked at his response. I mean, I was shocked at what came out of my mouth, but his response was incredible. He said, man, I've been watching you and you've given me faith that what you believe is real. And man, I heard that it, it was like, man, I am so sorry. I apologize to him and to the whole group, which seemed strange because that was their normal language, but it wasn't mine. You see, something was happening as I was keeping the faith and running. And in that moment, it's like I threw in the towel and they were like, nah. So I was encouraged, rebuked by a bunch of people that butchered the language all the time. But it reminded me that more than any sermon that I could ever have preached, my lifestyle was a message to them. I remember Jackie and I sitting down in service and we would sit in the same place over and over again when we were helping this other church and the security guard walks up to me one day and I had met this guy, seen him you know, in passing several times, but he walks up to me and says, man, you'll never know the impact that you've had on me. He says, my girlfriend and I are getting engaged and I've watched the marriage that you have. He never came to our house. He just saw us interact in service. He says, but you are so consistent in how you love your wife. Well, friends, it's because God is so consistent in how he loves us. And what I want to encourage you with today is don't be discouraged by what you don't see. Be encouraged by what's happening beyond what you can. And the first thing we need to do when we begin this journey is we need to get refocused on Jesus. Get your eyes off of them. Focus on him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your desire today to remind us of your truth and your word. Father, at times we have gotten our eyes off of you and we have focused on this or that or seen the success that others have had that is temporary. But I'm so grateful that you didn't leave us in Hebrews chapter 11, looking at the heroes of old, but you have taken us on the same journey that you took them, that they were all looking up. And when times got hard, they refocused themselves on you and your word. And I thank you, God, that we can do the same, that we have forever the example of Jesus to encourage us, to embolden us, to empower us, and to show us the way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, the author says it this way. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is so good. He gives us some context in what we are doing and how we are running. He says, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is saying in the same way that Jesus ran the race that was marked out before him, look at the reward that he has forever. He didn't receive the reward on this side of heaven, but he is now seated with the father there. The race was marked out for him to run and he ran it. And he is saying the race is marked out for you and we need to run it. Don't let the sin of today and the sins here in this world to keep you from accomplishing what God has for you. But you don't need to be good for goodness sake. We're being good because there's a reward that's set before us. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. I mean, listen, I understand persecution that I have felt that you've received, but none of us are on the level of Jesus who was perfect and deserves zero persecution. He is there to save all mankind. And they said, we have no king but Caesar. What? Crucify him. We want Barabbas, that other guy. What? But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. He goes on to say, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Stop looking at your circumstances temporary and look at the promise that's eternal. Verse four, and you have not yet resisted to bloodshed. 
striving against sin. He's like, listen, you are afraid of some temporary stuff, but it ain't gotten so bad yet where they, they martyring people. But Jesus was martyred and look what he caught him. He's seated at the right hand of the father. Don't be discouraged by the temporary setbacks or the struggles that you are receiving, because in the end, the reward is going to be worth it. Keep the faith and keep going. But Jesus didn't run this race alone. Jesus says, I don't do anything except that which I hear my father say or that which I see my father do. So Jesus was in constant relationship with the father. When the disciples said, we want to see the father, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. The two are one. And so if we're going to run this race well, just like any good athlete, we got to listen to our coach. We got to listen to the one who knows the beginning from the end, who's mapped this thing out the same way that Jesus did. He's performing all these miracles with the help of the Father and with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so for us, if we're going to run this race and not be discouraged and not be distracted, we need to get to know the heart of God the Father. We need to listen to him and understand what he's doing and in response to what he is doing. And we are going to reap an eternal benefit. Hebrews 12, 5 says it this way. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. This is really strong and powerful language. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. Listen to this talk. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. And amen to that. My father has done quite a bit of correcting in my day. And we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. This is so good. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. But nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is so good. The first thing it says is this. The creator of the universe, God the Father, wants to be in relationship with you, not as God and creator, I mean created, but as God and son, father and son, father and daughter, child of the living God. But in this relationship, there is some responsibility that he has, and there's a response that we have. Just like with our natural parents, whether we were born to them or adopted, they set the ground rules for how we're going to live in their home. Got a very dear friend of mine, he and his wife, they adopted some children from another country, and they love them. Before they even arrived, their heart was so full and ready to receive them. They bought all kinds of food, beautiful room, set things up for them. And when these kids arrived, the home was prepared. It was ready. There was a challenge. You see, these kids had lived in an environment where they literally had to fight tooth and nail for everything. If they were going to eat some nights, they had to break into the kitchen, rummage around and find what they could. Well, when they were adopted, they carried that with them. And so here they are in my friend's house in the middle of the night, sneaking into the kitchen, grabbing all kinds of food, meat and all kinds of things that they were dreaming of right there for them. And they go upstairs, clear out their sock drawer and put meat in there, hiding it for themselves. And man, what happens to meat when you take it out of the refrigerator? It don't take long for it to stink. And that's what began to happen. And so these delicate foods, these wonderful things that they were excited about, 
They took them thinking I got to take it unless if I don't, I won't get a chance to eat it. Sadly, nobody did because the food was rotten and their lifestyle wasn't allowing them to enjoy what was present. And so what my friend did as good father does. He chastened them. He corrected them. He was saying, listen, the lifestyle you used to live won't work here. I want you to enjoy this house and I want you to enjoy this food. But what you are doing is preventing any of us from enjoying this. And so he chastened them so that they could enjoy the benefit. The same is true with God the Father. He is calling us up and he is calling us in. And he is saying, listen, if you're going to live with me, then you need to act like me. The way you used to live in that other kingdom, that kingdom of darkness won't work here. And so he chastens us to get that out of us. Like my father growing up, he had all kinds of unique ways of chastening me. And I am so grateful. And my wife is grateful. And my children are grateful because my father took that time to chasten me. It's wonderful. And our God does the same. Was it fun in the process? Absolutely not. But like any good athlete that wants to be on the podium, I am so thankful. And that leads me to the third thing. Get healthy. This is so important. Take the time necessary when our God corrects us and redirects us and removes things from our life and then get healthy. Get healthy in our mind. Get healthy in our body. Get healthy in our soul. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 12, 12. Therefore, strengthen them hands and hanging down low and feeble knees and make the path straight for your feet so that what is lame may not, not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Get that body to be in alignment with the will of God. Tell your body, no, we are on a kingdom assignment. Get your mind right. Get your heart right. Get your body right so that you can live right. And the third, fourth thing is get holy. This is not on our terms or our standards. This is according to the kingdom of God. As those kids were adopted and they came into my friend's home, he was telling them a new way to live. You don't have to live the way that you used to in that realm, in that world, in that place, in that orphanage. Now you are adopted. And God says the same to us. 12, four, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You can't see God. You can't be a part of his kingdom acting like you used to in Satan's kingdom. You can't bring that behavior in here. No, -uh. the meat's going to stink. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled, taking that old way of living in the kingdom of darkness and trying to bring it into the kingdom of light is going to cause problems for you and for those around you. And God says that ain't coming up in here. You need to renew your mind in the word of God. Look at me and how I live, how I treat you is how I want you to treat everyone else. He goes on in verse 16, says, lest there be any fornicators or profane persons like Esau. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. That is crazy. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to be blackened in darkness in a tempest. He's speaking about the nation of Israel when God was giving Moses the law. Come on. And they saw that fire and that rumbling and that sound. They're like, I'm not going there. And listen, it says, and that sound of the trumpet and the voice of words. So that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken anymore. They're like, they were overwhelmed by it. For well, they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. It was a very holy, powerful moment. God, his glory descended on that mountain. And it was such a holy place that not even a beast could go near it. And all of these people saying, I don't want to be near this presence. It is too holy. It is too righteous. It is too overwhelming. 
And it was so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Listen, a lot of people talk about, oh, fear God. That's just a reverential fear. No, no, no. Moses was more than just reverentially fearing God. He was afraid. And friends, it's that kind of fear that keeps us on the right path. It's that kind of fear that says, you know what? Jesus said it this way. Don't fear who can harm the body, but fear the one that can throw body and soul into hell. That that word there, fear, is not talking about a reverential fear, but it's an awe fear, trembling of recognizing who you're dealing with. Our God is a holy God, a righteous God. He's a loving God, but he's a holy God. Don't forget it. And so if you're going to run the race that God has set before you, the only way you can run is in holiness. And then he talked about Esau. You see, God made a promise to Abraham. He made a covenant with him. Abraham was sad because he couldn't have any kids. And then finally, God says, you and your wife, Sarah, will have a child of promise. That child was born and that was Isaac. Laughter. In their old age, they had a child. Well, Isaac found himself in the same situation that his daddy was in. He prays for his wife. Lord, open the womb of Rebekah. And God hears his prayer and she conceives not one, but two children. The oldest twin being Esau, the second oldest being Jacob. God spoke to her while the children were in their womb. It was a really difficult, challenging pregnancy. And she told him, look, that younger son, he going to rule over the older. And we understand why when they get older. Esau's a hunter and he's not successful in a hunt and he's starving. He is hungry. Well, you know. Jacob's back home. He so like, look, I can make do with what's around here. And he paid quite a bit of attention to what his mother was doing, creates this wonderful bowl of stew, lentil soup. And man, if you're starving and you smell food, man, that's a love language brewing right there. And Esau says to Jacob, hey, bro, what you, what you cooking? And Esau's like, oh, that that's lentil soup. Uh, can I get some of that? Sure, but before I give you a bowl, what about your birthright? And Esau is like, man, what is a birthright to me? I'm on the verge of death. I got to get something in my stomach. And in that moment, the promise that God the Father made to Abraham and that promise that moved from Abraham to Isaac was supposed to move to the firstborn, but he sold his birthright of being the one to carry on his father's name and father Abraham's blessing. I don't care about that. Give me that soup. And so Abraham's blessing went to Jacob. Because Esau decided to sell his birthright of being the firstborn for a bowl of soup. And then when it's finally, finally his father Isaac blesses Jacob, and we know the little story, some trickery that went in there. Esau finds out the blessing that was supposed to go to him went to his brother. And he says he begged his father with tears, bless me too, dad. But he didn't care about living the life that needed to be lived before. He was just hurt because he missed out on the blessing. And friends, it's going to be that same way in the end times. So many people want to inherit the kingdom of God. But they don't want to live like they belong to God. And it's too late. And he's saying, you can't live your life like that. But the fifth thing, beyond getting holy, that doesn't sound all fun. But the fifth thing we need to do is we actually need to get excited. Understand the promise that we are a part of, that we're not following what Esau followed, selling all that we have for that which is temporary, this life. Remember, we're casting off all that restraint, not letting sin entangle us, not letting our stomach tell us what to do. We are living not by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And as we do so, and we live that kind of life, as we run this race, get excited. Hebrews 12, 12 says, but you have come to the Mount Zion, 
and to the city of the living God. We're not like those who are afraid. We are like those who are emboldened. We've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. As we are running this race, we are not alone. And to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, your name, my name is written in heaven. Get excited. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Get excited. Jesus has mediated a new covenant. And to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. He is saying, listen, Abel's blood cried out because he was martyred, but Jesus' blood cries out because what it says is you belong to me. His blood sprinkled, not just in the heavens, but here also on us, that I am covered by the blood of Jesus. And I'm now a part of that new contract, that new covenant that Jesus has established. And now as I'm running this race, I don't need to be weary. I can get excited because I am part of the, the company of angels, those who didn't didn't uh, fall with the one third. And I'm also a part of that cloud of witnesses. You and I, our names are registered in heaven. We are counted among them. So the sixth thing is get ready, get excited, but get ready. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying yet once more, I shake not the earth but also heaven. He's saying, get yourself ready because God is literally cleansing the earth, but he is also shaking and cleansing heaven and he is preparing it. Jesus says, I am leaving this earth. I am leaving this place and I am going to prepare a place for you. And he is up there cleaning that place out, shaking it so that Everything that is wicked and defiled, any heart, anything that is not holy and not a part of him, he is shaking it and he is getting it ready and he's getting us ready. And this is the seventh thing for us is we need to get refined. Get yourself ready for the shaking and be prepared for the refining that's taking place because heaven is holy and heaven is perfect and God is trying to get us ready so that we can enjoy it. Because if heaven's a perfect place and I still got some of that same nasty up, then I am going to defile it by my presence. My attitude and my behavior. Yes, Jesus washed me clean from my sins, but the Lord wants us to not just be there, but to live there and to enjoy it. And we will have the right attitude and the right heart, and the right being. We will be ready to enjoy what God has for us. Hebrews 12, 27 says, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Those parts of me that are nasty will be shaken out of my life, but those things that will remain will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and a godly fear. In this right here, for our God is a consuming fire. This is so good. This is saying when you come into the presence of the living God, that which does not belong in his presence, he burns it away. Gold. I've got this ring. It's nice. But man, listen, it's hard. Gold is not hard by itself. Gold, when it's in its purest form, you can mold it and shape it and do what you want with it. But when it's impure, it can be hard. And the Lord says, when you come into the kingdom of God, you can't be hard. Your heart must be softened. You must be pliable. And in order for God to do that, 
He's got to refine us. He's got to purify us. He's got to remove those things from us. And I'm not talking about getting into heaven or, or being righteous. I am saying to be able to be useful to God in heaven. He's taken care of our sins. We are forgiven. He said, listen, I forgive you and your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. But there's still the refinement that needs to happen because they're still part of me. That doesn't want to do what God wants done. And I'm looking at the life of Jesus who told God the father, I don't want to drink this cup. But not my will. Thy will. The whole process in the journey of running this race is allowing ourselves to be in the hands of the Lord, who is a consuming fire. And when we are in his presence, we go in deeper and deeper. We're not afraid to go up that mountain. We're not afraid of the trumpet sounds. We're not afraid of the word of God because we trust that the consuming fire is removing that from us that is not pleasing to him. Because he's a loving God and he's purifying, removing those things from us that are not needful. So what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? Father, I thank you for your desire to encourage us, to empower us, but also to refine us. So that when you see us, we look more like your son. So, Lord, I thank you that you have given us this privilege that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we belong to you. And so, Father, I thank you for the work that you're continuing in us so that we may be presented to yourself as a beautiful, spotless vessel, worthy. Father, we love you and we adore you and we thank you. I pray that my brothers and sisters would yield themselves to all that you want to do in them and through them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.